Welcome. I'm Lori Hanau, the founder of Global Roundtable Leadership. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the sixth episode of the Roundtable Dialogue series and for a very special conversation that we are calling Leading a Regenerative Business and a Regenerative Life with Carol Stanford, who is a friend, a colleague, and a co-learner. A little bit about Carol, oh my gosh. I'm glad that you'll have the experience of Carol because the details will not do her justice. Carol is the founder and designer of the Regenerative Business Development Community and the Regenerative Change Agent Community, or CAD, of which I am a part of the school, and executive producer of the Regenerative Business Summit. Carol launched two startups, ran and sold them, and did educating businesses globally, from big companies like DuPont and Google, to new economy businesses, and as she says, developing leaders toward the business of the 21st century with individuals who want a regenerative paradigm education. She's also a five-time TEDx presenter and a highly awarded best-selling author of six books and currently writing her seventh book, No More Gold Stars, which we will be touching on. And her books are required reading at leading business and management schools, including Harvard, Stanford, and Berkeley and MIT. Carol has also been diagnosed recently with ALS. She has created and invited us, a group of us, into those that chose to say yes, into a conscious dying community, and which I'm a part of. And this is something else that we will be discussing today, and the power and potential of learning for ourselves and about how we want to experience death through an end-of-life journey. Carol, I know your speech is now impacted a bit and that you may tire more quickly, and so we'll see where we journey today and for how long. And before we welcoming you in, I just also want to acknowledge the community who has signed up to be with us today. And for all those of you that may be listening or watching in the future, um, I want to thank you all for your care to be in a co-learning environment and for your care in regeneration, and I'm sure for your care for Carol. Two fortunate winners will get a chance to win a copy of Carol's most recent book, which we will also most likely be touching on today, Indirect Work. <laughs> and we'll drop the link in chat now, and I'll tell you more about uh, this at, at closing. And welcome. To it's an absolute delight to be with you today as we are. Yes. Your integrity and uh, your full being is always an inspiration to you. Thanks, yes. Lori. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm glad you warned people about my speech because it's one of the things ALS takes away in stages. And so, I always have to see how much you can understand me and how soon I wear out. But I'm here with full force for the moment. That's the best we can always be giving, right? Yeah. You know? Full will. And so thank you for showing up in yours. So first I want to say that I'm so interestingly disrupted already that in I feel that something has happened to me and my circuits have gotten like a little blown in the best of ways. I know this feeling because it's a somatic feeling that I get when I'm, I'm called into my greater integrity and authenticity and, and deeper learning. And, um, so I want to mean that this is the state that I'm in. <laughs> I'm we're in dialogue together. I would love to invite you with me into the dance and, and um, if there's something that I'm sharing or that you're sparked by, that we go anywhere, that we go yeah. off of that and we go anywhere. And if something else lands into <clears throat> you to say or for me to, to, to speak to each other in our co-learning and in the co-learning with this community, that we go there. Right. And can, can I start with the, my description of what you just said? Please. Way to, that people could watch for it. All right. So... We have three wings put together at which we can know ourselves. The body, 
which I work very hard in Texas to disrupt our stability so that we can actually notice what you just described. And then we can notice that there's a pattern of that may be useful. The middle ring is the external world where we try and make things work. Like you had your partner send me a note saying, would you send me a copy of something? And I mean, he said no. And I said it as directly as I could. Now, I knew that would destabilize you. And it's important because being destabilized gives us a choice. Now we can say, oh, I know what disabled is me. It's not Carol, it's something I'm attached to, being prepared and so forth. So that middle ring of the external world, we always try and manage well. But what I work on is the inner ring, the inner world, what's going on inside of you and your ability to see yourself and each and my ability to see myself. So all that went on in the last hour. And it's a perfect example of what I believe regenerative and developmental work is. Yeah, beautiful. And and I, I heard you say once that your aim is to disrupt certainty. Yeah. You're good at it. <laughs> Yeah, well, so another thing that you're talking about, I'm going to just keep using you and describe what you're doing because it would be good for everyone to notice in themselves. Each of us have an essence, and it's not a common idea in the world anymore. We are more familiar with personality, which is what's developed by our ecosystem, our parents, et cetera. <clears throat> but there's a part of us, well, parts are not the right word, a core of us, that is each distinctive, and I believe it comes in with you when you're born. If you listen to the sages, they would say before you're born. I don't. I can't testify to that. But I can testify that once you're born, you're seeking to express it. And one of the core aspects of my essence is disrupting certainty. And I've been doing it since I was four years old and getting in trouble for it, disagreeing with my father and people around me when I was in school, always in trouble. But for some reason, I, my grandfather said I was able to see what others couldn't see, in themselves uh-huh. particularly. And so my job was to help make them aware of it. And when I finally embraced it in my early 30s, I understood the magic of it. It wasn't me. It was a process. And so that's just so absurd. And what I bring to the world. And I have to do it to myself all the time in order to be in integrity. And so I engage in something called a long thought process, which is since I was in my 20s at least, I pick subjects that are profoundly important to the world. And I know that I will think I know it if I work on it. So I have a a law. I'm never allowed to write anything in the same way twice. Never allowed to present the same idea as though I know it. I have to write the next book and the next article and the next tweet and not say what I've said before. And that keeps disrupting me. And therefore, I mean... I think authentically able to invite others. Thank you for all that. And it's interesting because as I've walked in the excitement, they'll say something that has just always brought me delight is the myth. And and in the mystery, like I'm always thinking about the mystery of who we really are to each other. I also really light up by the community and the rigor there that I'm, and the rigor that I am deepening and cultivating in my thinking. Yeah. Light up for the development of my own self-determination and in the aim and the strengthening that I feel of my will. Like, I feel like I've been confused in this life by, I think I've been influenced and confused in a way that hasn't resonated with me about knowing our purpose like knowing your purpose and then setting your goals and having outcomes, having specific outcomes. And that's never resonated. Yeah. 
for me. And it's actually had me in, I think, some confusion and even some lost confidence along the way. And I find that in the practices that we are doing in the school, Mm -hmm. that I find that my understanding of AIM and the strengthening of my will is just like growing like a mushroom. Yeah. So, again, let me give you my words and a visual. Because I just made a post on LinkedIn this morning that said, most of my life I felt ostracized from the mainstream and in trouble. And even given tests and told I was mentally retarded. That was the term that was used. And uh, for a long time, I wanted to fit in. Uh, And if you go back to my three wings earlier, the middle ring of the external world, I wanted to fit with, I wanted to be cared about. I had a mother who was mentally ill and a father who was off the track and off the rails on abusing people around him. So Mm -hmm. I had to find another way uh, than the external world. What you're describing is your inner world, the inner being knew that most of that trying to fit in the outer world didn't make sense. And I've called that learning to be self-determined because the outer world, if it becomes our guide, then the authority, the authoritarian, the expert, the coach, the uh, other, whoever the other is, becomes our direction point. Or how, what do you call that when something spins around? Well, anyway, the sense of the other knows what's best for us. Self-determining is an epistemology of returning people's uh, uh, gyroscope. That's the world of working on. Right, to be the center of us. And not that we don't listen, but we listen through frameworks. We the, the, I've been showing a framework of three wings. If we listen through that and know that we have our body to relate to the external world we want to fit in, and we learn to use that external world as a growth thing for our inner being. So when now someone says to me, what I'm saying is a nonsense, I go to first my inner being and say, yeah, other people's opinions are not useful, but probably then my reaction to it is very useful. And so if I learn to do that inner work using the outer world instead of adopting the outer world, I have a straight, narrow kind of path that leads as me learning to think for myself, which is, by the way, the name of the new book, which will be out shortly. I'm not still writing it in production. <laughs> no more gold stars. Thank you. And while we're on No More Gold Stars, the learning to think for ourselves, is it, is, is it also, do you go into behaviorism? Behaviorism, so stem to turn. I give the history of why behaviorism has undermined ability because it was at the turn of the last century when the world kind of came apart and people quit living on farms and went to the city into an assembly line. And when the first time uh, mass education was mandated and schools were built by behavioral psychologists, oh, sorry. And then even parents were told they didn't know how to raise children. That whole philosophy was kind of built into everything from business to military. And it was because the behavioralists, the behavioral psychologists, wanted a reputation that was similar to natural science. They were trying to raise their kind of veneration of being a science. And what it did is undid everything about how humans can see themselves and I'm writing a post I'll have on my sub stack by the weekend about this little section here of how behaviorism uh, actually brought in something else I'd like to trash a little bit. And this is what we make a lot of people mad. Once we 
I, and I like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if what we did is for years, the behavioral psychologists were the only ones who could say what was right and wrong. They got all the laws so nobody could claim to know or be a psychologist. I did all that and got registered. But I realized in about the 1960s, we been towards a whole new group who wanted that thing of being above other people. And they're called coaches, mentors, leaders, all the kinds of things that someone knows more than others. So once I figured that out, I quit using the idea of coach, and I switched to learning to be a resource, which you know about. It's the reason I don't answer other people's questions. I just turn the question back, but in a way they can have a framework to figure it out for themselves. So there we are. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's so interesting to me how I can't, I feel that I can't separate regenerative ways from learning. I feel like they're bedfellows. And um, I disagree. Say more. The word learning has importing ideas from it. I learn from others. I think you can't separate regeneration and development, which is a much more powerful idea. Yeah. And I think you mean that. I but do mean it's, that. All right. Now go say it. Say it again without yeah, talking thank about you. Okay. Thank you. Regeneration, regenerative principles, regeneration, and, and development. And thank you for that. And I, and I do know the power of words. And this is where I feel like my own will is strengthening from where I'm habitualized. Yeah. Um, and, and even my own conformity. And again, like what you just did, like by resourcing, thank you for naming that. And, and so that I can come back into the developmental energy and dynamism that I meant. But what I, w w and where the tangle is for me is around the conformity of learning. It's what you were just saying about the expert and about how often, when we're not committed to a developmental way of being and taking responsibility for the rigor of our own thinking, yeah. how easy it is to stay asleep and to take somebody else's ideas at face value. And so right. leaving them unexamined within myself, citing others versus coming up with my own ideas, uh, yeah. the glorification of others, how when we're in community like we are in CAD and we're learning and ways of being, that so often, no matter where, in whether I'm being I'm resourcing or resource or the new insights that come, you know, that the yeah. ideas that I may have and another has, but then the, the insights that come between us all. And, um, and yet, this is not spoken about or, or encouraged. In my own life, that, that anyone here that is interested that may not know much about regenerative ways and are here because they care to learn that I'm saying now and what Carol and I are dialoguing on over this time supports you in wanting to dig in more around your own learning and ownership and your commitment to your own originality, integrity, and authenticity. So let me give a way to start on that because that's Thank a you. beautiful invitation. Uh, my b last book that Lori held up was called Indirect Work. And the new one that's out is following a pattern which I wish I'd figured out before. I'm, I've been, had written five best selling and award winning books, and all of them were written as an, uh, based on my experience in the field, working with companies over a period of time. So I had a pretty good foundation for people wanting to read these. Now, I said, I figured out. Other people learning from me is slowing down self-determination from their own experience. 
Bob, we're going to write a book in good faith and have people do what they always do, underline, write in the margin, take notes, go figure out where they can take the story to show them they apply it to their situation. And I absolutely almost stopped publishing that book. And then I had to tell when I was a young girl, uh, my mother's boss, because we were really poor, would take my sister and I to entertainment like the opera and ballet. And they did something, in particular in the opera, which I was always asking questions about. It was called the intermezzo. And <laughs> it was a pause in the play. But they always had, at least in Dallas, where I was, they had a little convocation in various parts of the foyer where people came and talked about the opera and how it was affecting them and what the story I thought, could I create any remetros in a book? And so and now mm. if you go, and that book is only 140 pages, and it talks about the most powerful development of change in the world. It has the most powerful history. And in between every chapter, you have to stop and watch what you did with it. Did you immediately try and adopt it? Did you question it? Here's some questions you might use to disrupt yourself. And so it was a workbook embedded in a book. And I then created book clubs to engage in the inner bits of and watching themselves and each other and see what their tendency was to go toward adopting these brilliant ideas I created right in the book and the great case stories. And by the time, and and my I had pre-readers, and they all came back to me at the end of their pre-reading before it was published and said, that was the most disrupting thing I've ever done. And that it made me notice how mechanical I am and how much I take other people's ideas and examine if they got power, star power of some kind, I want to be next to them. I want to associate. I want to identify. So I'm now in the new book. It will be out in the fall. Did that on a whole other level so that people are not adopting unexamined uh, other ideas. And they're learning how to think for themselves, which is not easy because your parents and your parents' parents and at least a hundred years of relative in every profession have been taught to not think for themselves mm -hmm. and to learn. So I we're gonna die pretty soon. But if I leave anything behind, it's don't trust me. Don't trust anyone. Uh learn to examine and undo the mess we've created. Even people using the word regeneration are using behaviorism. They can't see themselves. I do feel inspired to read the introduction of indirect work. Sure. You talk about Socrates and the description of the cave in which people are chained mm -hmm. in place and unable to move. And how deep and how diligent we need to be ourselves. And you say it's not enough to tell them they're caught in a shadow play. To free them from the cave, one must build the capability and consciousness that will enable them to examine the hidden sources of their perceptions of reality. One must grow a culture and community of fellow seekers. And uh, if anyone is out there is even wondering how to create a regenerative business, I'd say everything applies, whether it's your life, you know, a business, um, your family, you know, if you want to break out of the conformed ways you may have been parenting, you know, that the same, the same consciousness applies, is one must grow a culture and community of fellow seekers, each aiming to break the mechanical patterns of their thought. This is what I mean by indirect work. And then we do this by learning to challenge the apparent evidence of our senses. Indirect work teaches us to discern and then evolve the reality-making apparatus within ourselves. I wanted to tell a story over what you read. The one thing, I have many life experiences which are quite extraordinary, and I'm very grateful for it. I was at Berkeley in the middle of the free speech movement and the war in Vietnam, 
and I was in a classroom with, um, I forgot what was his name. He was with the creator of the atom bomb, and he studied with Einstein at Princeton, and he told a story because I asked a question about what does Einstein mean that we should not use uh, the old method when we try and create the new. He said that in 37 different ways. He said, Einstein said, when he asked, was asked that question, it's a difference between a billiard ball theory of life and a, a matrix view. So the template you're talking about, Laurie, that you commented on the reading was in Einstein's view, like a billiard or pool table where you have an idea about where all the pockets would be, where all the balls go, and you are the cue stick holder and in charge of moving people with a direct hit into the pocket you think they should be in. And Einstein said, that's a completely wrong worldview. What you need is a worldview of the mother carrying a child, a matrix where the mother cannot directly control the outcome of that child or even her own, but she can do all the development work on herself and on the womb, the body that's carrying the fetus and to full healthy process, but it's all indirect. And until we understand that's how the quantum field works, is indirectly building capability, building ecosystem, and letting go of that we are the cue stick and that we are the determiner of the rules of the game for everyone else. That seems to me a lot of what I was trying to write in indirect work. And our time is flying, as I, as I knew that it would. And I just want to uh, invite anyone that is listening to uh, put a question you have into chat for us, for Carol or for us. We're going to do a practice that we do in, in all of Carol's work, actually, when you ask the question. And that is why your question matters to you. Put your question into chat why your question matters, and what is your best answer. And do give this a try. Like if you have a question, play with us in this way for your own ownership and depth of thinking. And so give us your question, why your question matters, and your best answer. Not easy in chat, I know, but let's make a go of it. <laughs> and then also at this time, if you do want to just say anything, to Carol, also, if you've got something to say to her, please feel free to use chat in that way, too. But if you do, anyone that has a question, we'd love to dance with you in the question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I never answer questions. Uh, they told me I was going to do that. I said, this is going to be a long, quiet time because I don't <laughs> believe that I have the best answer. So thank you for going with it, Lori. Oh, absolutely. And I, I just so um, adore, appreciate myself and I'm inspired by your integrity, your alignment with what you believe, what you practice, and what you are calling us into practice. So it's so, a better so epistemology. I'm nurturing the womb, not the pocket I want you in. That's Ooh. an example of doing that. I want to hear some of those before we get off, if we can. We'll see if anyone dares to dance with us, Carol. I'd love to go for a few minutes into your conscious dying journey. Sure. And I'd love to share as a way in, as Carol, and as you stayed close with me on, and we're so compassionate for where I needed to be so oh. present with my mother for a couple yeah. of years and as she was in her journey. And I was very taken by my mom because she had always shared with me that her two fears of dying, the two ways she hoped she never would die were stroke and dementia. Yeah. How did she die? Both right? of them. She got a vascular stroke, 
a vascular stroke that brought on dementia like a steam engine. Yeah. And I watched her own integrity. I felt like I daily watched her integrity of confronting her fears. Yeah. And because she so believed and believes that this life is an adventure of learning and the quality being in good relationship, the terror was huge. Yeah. And I was taken by how she didn't turn away from it, but she turned toward it. Yeah. And, and then someone both you and I know, and I love very much, Peter Strugatz, a, a soul right. brother of mine. Right. He wrote to me at the top of the year and he said, I hope your challenges are greater this year than they have been yet. And yeah. at first I was startled by that. And then I was like, what a fantastic hope yeah. for someone. And so I was taken when you and I talked a while back and you shared with me about your fears and you getting ALS because of your fear of suffocation. No, okay. I didn't have fear. Yeah, but suffocation is a challenge for you, right? And well, we're almost, uh, yes, but I don't afraid of it. I was born breech first, and so you nearly suffocate in that process. And many uh, people who have breech birth end up with terrible claustrophobia. And so I had always, when I got diagnosed, I thought about that and thought, did I invite this in? But here's what I think is true. I don't believe that particular thing is how the path goes. I believe I chose it to die of ALS before I was born. I picked that. And I believe that, we, I may call this stuff up, but it helps uh, give a, a reality to it that I have confirmed with Tibetan Buddhist schools and Hindu t processes Zen, Buddhism, Buddhism, and all of them believe you pick your death before you're born. And so I picked ALS because it would be the most difficult path. And it's going to everyone who hears I have ALS said, oh, I'm so sorry, and genuinely, and because they know that you're paralyzed the muscles at a time, and finally, your voluntary muscles, and finally, your breathing is paralyzed. I'm actually gonna die a different way, but it's called V-SED. And we can talk about that some other time. It's the way the sages die. But if you would decide you're gonna do something like ALS, you better commit to doing it with without fear, which I don't really have. I've never been afraid of dying, and I'm not sure why, but I've always noticed it was there with this. The thing, it was dying unconsciously that matters. And for the last 50 years, I've done a lot of studying of dying practices around the world. And I am creating, and I'm interested in creating a whole different culture around death. And so I want to change my own consciousness and work. I want to build communities and for me, like the CAD community who committed to participating with me in a set of conscious processes to their development. So we do a lot in the Western world for the dying person, but we don't understand that death opens a portal of energy and for people you love, like with your mother, that you can see and discover and learn about yourself. But we don't yeah. ever, we don't build anything without that happen. You are in a community and your, your being is, I think, pursues that work anyway. But I'm trying to design not only different practices for the being that's leaving, but for the people that can stand in the portal of energy it gets created with a whole different set of practices. And if all goes well, you change your culture much bigger. And I uh, am re recording those and people, if they want, can buy the recording and engage in the process that we're doing with the materials. And then if you actually want to, you can reach out to 
for air me to say you like to you bought the recording and you can see what we're doing and you'd like to be developmentally in a developmental process of dying a conscious dying so that's how i've taken all that and moved it yeah carol and you just spoke to the two key parts for me one even with my mom was being present with her yeah. and of course as a daughter with a mother with a parent at end of life tending to yeah. her and but i was so taken by what i how i developed yeah how i developed and what we miss as a society in so many ways but if we just even stay here what we miss about our own developmental growth and journey by turning away from death and in conversation and in being close with anyone around us that's on that part of their path. And the second thing I want to really, I want to name here, and again, if anyone is interested in being a part of this uh, conscious dying community of Carol Sanford, you can reach out to Carol through carolsanford.com or yeah. you can reach out to me. And, but the second piece, Carol, is your commitment to for those of us that care to be in this threshold with you and to walk this journey with you, that it's about our learning right. of our death and dying right. and how we want to live and how we want to uh, transition. And we are not there in this way for you. You are inviting us to be there for our own learning and our own developmental learning and which in these rare instances of being able to be in close in our current society. And I do want to thank you for what you're, what you've created. There's one other thing that I ask, which is if you do this process, you dedicate the merit, which is a Buddhist idea, instead of your karma, to the karma of others, that can include me, but it may be so to your other and to people we have known who, pass on that we want to help support their passing and passing is not is a pretty good word but not a way passing mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. so we would invite everyone to join that with us also yeah and then we have someone who's willing to dance with us and oh, good. Uh, we have we have a, a question here but you know what? I just want to take 30 seconds of silence, actually. Because I don't want to leap right into this question of what we just said and what your invitation is to us around conscious dying. Right. And so I just, I just want to pause and be in silence for a minute and have people absorb this because it's unfortunately in a way, but also fortunately for now, it, it, this is so unique, what you're inviting, Carol. Okay, this is from a total sister of mine who actually is, amongst many things, a dancer. So I love that she's the one willing to dance with us. Right. <laughs> In a world of increasing presence of chat GPT, do you know what that is, Carol? Yes. Okay. Um, AI. It's, oh, oh, AI, thank you. It, it seems more like more and more we are witnessing AI talking with AI. My question is for those of us who are creating intentional communities, what is the best way to not resist what is already here, but dance with it? Yeah. It matters to me because I'm feeling the shrinking of our humanity. My best answer is creating more intentional community. I love this question. My son is in the field, and so that's why I know about it. Uh, he knows AI and is on the forefront, and he's my best source for my thinking. But I love the why it's important, because I do see a lot of people being afraid, and it seems like the think the number of technologies particularly we've been afraid of in the past that we thought would ellipse 
humans. We must have a fairly small idea about the potential of humans. And I think that's where the four, and it's the same thing that's behind almost everything I write. We assume people are fixed where they are and that we've done all we could do, really. And so I think if you just ask the question, what I would do is ask the question, what is unique to humans? It cannot be made mechanical. And right now, not a lot, because humans are very mechanical. We're joining, but we have the capacity, and this was really the purpose of indirect work. We have the capacity to develop consciousness. I say there are three things, and I don't know her name, but... Lori. Lori, oh, okay. <laughs> I know, uh, Lori Darling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to develop capability, culture, and community, and consciousness. So it's true for me also, the unique community, but with a development of culture in it. If it's a community of protection or a community of mechanicalness, it doesn't do us any good to have a community. But if we build capability to use frameworks and to think in a more whole way and to exercise consciousness and culture, nothing can replace it that's mechanical. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I love and, the question. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. Carol, I just want to thank you. I cannot believe it feels like a blink. Yeah. I, just a blink of and went by. And I just want to thank you so much for who you are, for what you're here in your, in your commitment to your development to bring to this precious world and to humans. And I wish we could even go deeper in, in, and so maybe we can even, you'll be writing about it, I know, in Substack and maybe on LinkedIn, but about this, about what you're naming of us not giving humans enough credit and not really understanding yeah. humans and even uh, how we move to our relationship to nature. We turn, there's so much here that we're not going to be able to go into, but I do want to thank you for leaving me wanting more and leaving, I'm sure everyone here wanting more. And may we all turn that more in, inside ourselves and inside our own development and our own learning and into what our aim is to offer the world through ourselves. And so, so much love to you, Carol. And thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. And thanks to Sebastian and Julie for helping me get all the system working. Much of love. Team GRTL. Oh, We're an ensemble with you, exactly. Carol. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. All right, you. And to the community, just as we close, if this was your first time joining us, we hope you'll listen to the other five parts of the Roundtable series, and we'll be dropping the links into chat uh, for you uh, to check out. And also, don't forget, you still have time to enter uh, the book giveaway. And hang on. I... Uh, of indirect, indirect work, Carol Sanford's latest book, and and that you can uh, have your chance to win a copy of of her book. We're going to be giving away two copies, and all you need to do is enter your email into the form, and our team will notify you if you're a winner. And and also look for her book that will be coming out soon. No more gold stars. I know she's tremendously excited about it. And if you want any more information on all of her books and on her communities, please go to carolsanford.com. Thank you all for your care. So great to be with you today. Thank you for dancing with us and all my best to you. I hope to see you along the way.